This is a subject that, um, you know, I teach literature and human rights, and, and that's very important to me. But this is the most important work that I think I do in my life, which is working with people who have survived or people who are at high risk for being trafficked. And so I'm going to share something about that with you today. Um, and I just want to sort of tell you what I'm going to talk about so that you know, because it's a little bit of a funky talk. Again, the first thing to know is that I'm not talking about um, post-conflict situations and reintegrating women in that way. But I am ta I'm focusing my remarks on Bangladesh, Nepal, and India, and girls and women who are trafficked from Nepal and Bangladesh into India. Now, both Nepal and Bangladesh are places that have had profound political instability that I believe um, you know, there's evidence that that contributes to trafficking. Um, but probably much more relevant for the girls and women who are trafficked is chronic poverty, um, gender devaluation, and, and gender norms that devalue girls and women, um, and, and those kinds of sort of economic and social causes. Um, however, I've really thought a lot for the purposes of this talk about how conflict, political conflict, might come into play. So I'll talk about that a bit. I'm going to talk about Made by Survivors, which is um, we use the tools of economic empowerment, education, and hope for um, helping girls and women to reintegrate. And I, you know, that word I'm not so crazy about, but to 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 really rebuild lives after the trauma of slavery. Um, and so, and I'll tell you a little bit about the organization. And I want to tell you about an innovative business solution that we're really trying to make happen, and just kind of get you excited about the idea of partnerships really working from the ground up, trying to shift the way that business as usual is done. And I mean that both in the corporate sense and in the government senses. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the whole, the sort of spectrum of gender on the life cycle of a woman in some parts of the world, the devaluation, really profound devaluation of girls' and women's lives starting at birth and going right through the life cycle. And I'm going to give you a little case of that. And that, I think, is the nut that we have to crack if we're going to, if we're going to solve this problem. We're not going to, you know, I don't have any illusions that we're going to end sex trafficking, um, unfortunately. I really don't think that that's going to happen. But I think we can really put a pretty major dent in it if we can disrupt not only some of the, the really the hardcore business um, of trafficking, and it is a business, and that's why it's so entrenched, um, but also if we could shift gender norms. And I don't, you know, yeah. I don't know what the possibility for that is, but, I, but I'd like to try and put some good minds to work on it. Um, so I'm going to tell you, Made by Survivors started, um, it's an organization that uh, really our main, the main thing that we do is to employ girls and women who have been trafficked or who are at high risk for being trafficked. And this is a way to either prevent them being trafficked or to help them to have lives after they've been trafficked. Um, the way that it started is kind of a cool story. My now friend, uh, dear friend, Sarah Simmons, was a songwriter. She lived on Cape Cod. She had a nice nice house, two kids, dog uh, by the beach, husband is a stockbroker, it's all good. And she gets, a, um, she gets a song, one of the songs she wrote into a film that wins an award in the Tribeca Film Festival. So she's off to New York for a glam weekend, she's all excited. She gets down there and they give her one ticket to see anything else, any other film in the film festival. And so she looks, she's all excited and she sees like there's one film she can watch and it's called The Day My God Died. I don't know if anyone has seen this film. Have you seen it? Yeah, Inc incredible film, right? So, so she says, but she says, I want to see that film. I'm here for this really fun weekend. That's a very depressing subject. I don't really want to do that this weekend. And plus, I know about, you know, I know about sex trafficking. I know it's bad. I don't know. And then, but then, you know, it was like free ticket. Only thing I can go to is that. I'm going to use my free ticket. So she goes and sees the film. And if you haven't seen the film, I highly recommend it. It's available on PBS. It's just one hour. She sees the film, and what strikes her about the film is not that it, the stories in the first half, you'll remember the first half hour are stories of girls who've been trafficked from Nepal. And when I say girls, I mean girls between the ages of 7 and 11. Maybe the oldest one is 16 at the time she's trafficked. So girls. Um, it's not those horror stories of those girls who've been trafficked, you know, the, the most horrific, drugged, kidnapped, all of those kinds of stories, um, who have now been come back, they've been rescued, and they're back in Nepal, and now are suffering from AIDS, um, stigma, the, the, the stigma of trying to go back to societies which now brand them as bad girls who are ruined and who you know can't really come home again. All of that, she said, well, that's, 
okay, that's, that's, that was the first half of the film. But what really moved her to do something was the second half, because what she learned was those girls, who are now some of them women, set up uh, an underground railroad between Nepal and India, and they went back into the brothels where they had been held, and they brought out more girls. They set up, they've now set up. This is um, Anuradha Kerala, in case and some of you might have seen her because she's a CNN hero as of last year. Um, she created something called Mighty Nepal. She is, she's, she's a hero. And um, she, she, they now have border control where it's survivors who are monitoring those borders. And so it's this really this story of empowerment. And so for some, Sarah said, my God, if, if these girls who are really stigmatized, ha do not have resources, traumatized, if they can go, get up and go back into those brothels and take out more girls and be, be, have the courage and the resource to do that, then surely I can do something. Um, and so she called her husband and said, well, our lives are going to be different now. <laughs> and since that day, have, has devoted her life to this, this um, problem. And the way that she did it was to start volunteering. Pretty simple. So just if you, you know, if you ever have that kind of seed, a, a little fuel, a little spark in your belly, you know, just get out there and start. So she just started. She went to, fortunately, Friends of Mighty Nepal is headquartered right here in Boston. She called them up. She said, can I, can I just come, like, stuff them, you know, tell me what to do. And they did. They took her. And then she ultimately went over to Nepal, um, and she met with Anuradha, and she, she took a tour of Mighty Nepal, which is Mother Nepal, um, this shelter home for girls who've survived and women. And she asked Anuradha, what can I do? What, what can I offer? And she thought for sure Anuradha was going to say money, you know, awareness, um, raise awareness, raise money. And Anuradha, she didn't say that. She said, I need jobs for my girls. I need jobs. And Sarah thought, well, how am I going to get jobs for you girls? Like, you know, I'm, in, I'm in the U.S. I'm on the other side of the world. She was walking through the, the shelter home, and she said one day it was sort of like, like I'm looking at your big window out there. It was like a window and, and this beam of light, you know, as if from the goddesses, coming down on a pile of really sparkly stuff. And she saw it, and she said, what's that? And they said, oh, nothing. It's just art therapy stuff, stuff that they make in art therapy, beading and whatever. And she said, oh, my gosh, well, let's sell it. And they said, we can't sell it. You know, it's a dime a dozen here. There's no market for it. And she said, well, I can sell it. So she brought a suitcase back and did a pilot. And then since that was sort of the birth of Made by Survivors. Um, so now I'll talk to you about the evolution of the business many years hence. But it's really just based on making goods made by survivors. Um, and part of the reason is that it's um, you know to to get move past this moment of freedom. And if you've, any of you have read Kevin Bale's book, it's kind of the Bible of you know trafficking. Although there's much now much more recent stuff that's also of great interest. But I don't think anything will ever replace the work that Disposable People did when it when it came out and still does. And he opens that book with a story of a woman, and he says, you know. Uh, Freedom is a is a is not a moment. It's not the moment of rescue. It's not that dramatic moment that we often hear about. Nick Kristoff, you know, by the way, who I was just out seeing him be honored at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, and he has done so much to raise awareness of so many things. But he did buy two slaves, and you know that was his sort of strategy in a moment um, was to buy t two slaves that he really felt strongly about and then you know unfortunately one of them went back because she was addicted to drugs and but it, among you know the abolition community that's just a, you just don't that's a big no no you know you don't do that for the obvious reason they will just be replaced and you've now just trafficked two people so so in any case um, it, uh, let me sort of get back to where I'm, I'm going with this. Um, Kevin Bales, on the other hand, moves us past the moment of rescue. And he says, it's not just a moment. It's a process. For someone to become free, really, it's a process. And it's about thinking about how to reorient minds toward choice making and autonomy and independence. And that's one of the things we try to do. Um, the other thing is, you know, if there's no jobs for, for girls and women who go into the shelter home system, the very small percentage of girls and women who are rescued often end up, most often end up in shelter homes. Um, they have to get moved, they got to move on to make room for more to come in. But oftentimes there's nothing for them after that. There's nowhere for them to go. Um, there are other problems with that, with the whole thing of girls and women being in shelter homes. One of them is that if they're in a shelter home in India, which many of them are after being rescued, they are now 
illegal immigrants, and so they have to be forced back to their home country, but that often means sending them back to the terrible situation that got them trafficked in the first place, and there's, there's a very high re-trafficking rate for girls and women. So, so this idea of independence, um, economic empowerment, education, all of that is really key, but so far it hasn't gone very far in, this, in the community. There's a lot of attention on the first part, the rescue part, and less on um, <clears throat> the reintegration part. So I want to just show you a little chart of the trafficking cycle and show you where we work. Made by Survivor works in the very before trafficking even happens. We work in the prevention moment. We work in a lot of communities where girls are at very high risk for being trafficked. And I'll show you a map, but you know, that there's a cluster of border areas up in northern India that's Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and those borders are very porous, and girls and women and men, people are trafficked all the time. And they're often trafficked through those borders and then onto the Middle East or to um, other areas as well. So there are whole villages. I remember Sarah coming back from an early trip and saying, I was just in a village in Varanasi see up in the north of India where I literally did not see a teenage girl. I mean you see like you see young girls, you see women, you see boys, you see and you do not see a girl between the ages of 11 and 18 and you see a lot of new roofs and you might see a TV antenna and you know really shocking when you talk about source areas for sex trafficking um, you know just sort of shocking statistics and so we're trying to work in those areas where girls are at very high risk for this and we know they are they're just repeating repeatedly trafficked from there. Um, <clears throat> you know, the bigger things that will help there are systematic and institutional changes in terms of poverty, in terms of race, class, or caste equality, gender equality. And, and in particular, women's control over their own reproductive lives. Um, but in the interim, until all of those big things happen, we're trying to work very, on very focused on empowerment strategies for vulnerable people. And you know, as Kevin Bales says, what's the number one criteria for being becoming a slave is vulnerability now in our global economy. So then, we are not involved at all in the moment of trafficking. But there are, you know, the ways in which people are trafficked. They're tricked. They're coerced into labor. They're tricked with a false job offer, that with a marriage offer, um, and they are, or sometimes given a false contract, they're transported often and sold. And the people who work on that are more about law enforcement um, and, and that kind of, you know, that's really a kind of a legal, that's the legal moment, as is the rescue and resistance kind of moment. There's a lot of NGOs involved in rescuing girls and women. We don't operate there either. We don't go into the brothels, although we have a lot of partners who do, who go in and, and help to get people out. Um, we don't also work in the, that moment of rescue where, you know, which is often about brothel raids, um, the prosecution, you know, people more and more are trying to actually prosecute not only traffickers but also pimps and madams and the whole sort of setup. Um, <clears throat> but we do start working again in the shelter and rehabilitation area and then we're really all about what comes after that. Because girls and women can get stuck there in shelters, sometimes for years, and then, or they can get to the point where it's like, well, you got to get out of the shelter. So you're going to go back home. And as I said, when girls and women are sent back home, um, oftentimes they're going back to profound stigma. And I mean, so it's like if your value as a woman is about marriage in many of those communities, you can't be married anymore. There's a problem with that now. You are marked. You've lost your virginity. You've lost your value. Um, and so oftentimes families won't accept girls back home or communities won't, will ostracize them. Oftentimes they have HIV, or HIV and AIDS or other diseases. Um, so we're trying to work on empowerment in that moment. Um, and here's another just sort of visual of it. Full we're sort of full circle. We're before, we're before the, the cycle starts and then we're after. We are working on prevention and we're also working on aftercare. Um, here's a map that can just kind of, let me see if I have a, um, I don't have a good, cursor there. So this is where we're operating. So um, here we are in India going up through here. Um, and here is Bangladesh, here is Nepal, here is Bhutan. If you are, if you have a Nepali or an Indian passport, you can 
go right back and forth here. That's like it's like the U.S. and Canada used to be, um, and <laughs> before. And then, um, same thing with Bangladesh and India. And so here, you know, there's a huge trafficking rate here because Bengali, you know, Bangladeshi people and Bengali people, West Bengal, India, are very very similar in terms of language, culture, religion, ethnicity. And so that's just a very porous border area. Um, so we're made by survivors operates. We are here in Calcutta is our headquarters. We are also over here in Mumbai. And then we operate up here in this region um, around, so we're, we're, uh, we have new, a new center um, up in this northern region. Bihar is one of the most common places that our girls are trafficked from. So Bihar and Maharashtra states in India. So a lot of the girls and women that we serve have been trafficked from within India and then many, many from Bangladesh or from Nepal. So that's just to give you a sense of where we're talking about. And I thought I would just talk to you a little bit about, so, um, just to, to really relate this to what you do and think about all the time as a consortium, um, it used to be that many, all, almost all of the girls that we saw that were trafficked from outside of India, that were trafficked across international borders, were from Nepal. That was kind of at the beginning of our work, which is about seven years ago or more eight years ago now. Um, so I thought I'd just tell you about Nepal. As of the latest um, trafficking in persons report out of the State Department, it's a tier two country, meaning tier three is the lowest. It's not doing well in terms of um, taking care of trafficking and uh, attending to trafficking. And so the way they kind of rank it is they have not met international standards for preventing trafficking, but they are, they are working on it. Um, <clears throat> they have not ratified the UN protocols around trafficking, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and the Palermo Protocol from 2000, so they have not signed on to the international instruments. They don't provide citizenship documents to female victims of trafficking who've been returned, and that's a huge issue, this issue of citizenship. Once someone's trafficked, that they, if they don't, they don't have any papers, their papers have been, if they had them, they've been taken from them, and so when they go back, now they are, they are paperless and stateless, and if you know, you know, I'm sure in your, if you're studying human rights, you know that's the gap in human rights, right, for the, the state person, the refugee. I mean, this was identified at the time that the UN Declaration was created by the philosopher Hannah Arendt, among others, that, you know, without, without really the crux, the person who is just a bare human, who is nothing but human, who has no citizenship to protect her, is the one who needs human rights the most and is the one who can't access them. Um, that there's a great deal of corruption, traffickers using ties to politicians and so on to facilitate their trafficking. Um, this is all about Nepal as a trafficking source. A pr you know, the estimate is that 15 to 20,000 Nepali and women and children are trafficked annually into Indian brothels. Um, here's the political picture in Nepal. So Nepal was always, a, you know, a monarchy, um, and in 1996 there was a, a rebellion against the the monarchy there and it went on for about 10 years and it was a very bloody rebellion um, and I'm not a historian of this area or a political scientist so I'm sort of giving you a very bare bones thing just to try to puzzle out how much has political instability had to do with trafficking rates. Um, <clears throat> in 2001 the whole royal family was killed and the brother of the king took power and then sort of made these states of emergency that really really increased human rights violations in Nepal for the next five years or so people being tortured and disappeared and any opposition being crushed. In 2006, there was a peace agreement. And so a lot of that really intense political turmoil kind of died down. Now, they still have not managed to create a constitution to this day, but I think the, a lot of that armed conflict has kind of stopped or at least um, is not as intense as it was. I don't think that we're hearing about those kinds of um, things happening. So relative calm in Nepal now. In Bangladesh, on the other hand, also tier two, also has not ratified the relevant UN documents. Um, detains, is known to detain possible trafficking victims indefinitely, f either for um, you know, a breaking migration or citizenship or prostitution laws. So this is one of the big problems for trafficked girls and women, that you are then accused of prostitution or of being an illegal immigrant or whatever it is and held um, you know, in, in a prison. So that is regular in 
uh, Bangladesh. There's apparent, you know, again, these estimates of people who are trafficked are very difficult to come by. So these are from NGOs and other reports. Um, the estimate is 30,000 a year in Indian brothels. Um, and that there has been a significant increase in the number of Bangladesh women and children in the past two decades. But I, from my sources on the ground, people who are actually working with um, the trafficking, and they are in the investigation business. They're the ones who are investigating missing claims. And I'll show you some stuff from them. They're saying they're seeing a, a very significant rise just in the last few years, um, and fewer Nepali girls and women. <clears throat> So the push factors, the reasons that girls and women are often being trafficking, being trafficked, the largest one is just globalization. Um, the whole, everything that comes with that consumer model um, of export and then you know, people migrating for jobs and not no real sustainable livelihoods being created within the country except for kind of factory labor and that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but then there's also the problem of when men are migrating to the cities from rural to urban spaces um, for jobs, they often you know, a sex trade often develops around that and people are trafficked for that. And they often demand or would like, you know, the demand is for someone who can speak their language or who is like them. So that happens. But here's also the political instability. Um, Bangladesh, and let me just go back to the map. Um, Bangladesh, which is here, used to be East Pakistan, and then here was West Pakistan at the partition of India. And it wasn't until 1971 that Bangladesh became its own country. Um, so that you have all kinds of families that are, you know, there's just a whole history of crossing borders that weren't borders before. So a lot of movement across those borders, and that contributes now to problems of trafficking and, and um, that come from migration patterns. Um, there's also a long struggle between two parties in Bangladesh that has just sort of gotten increasingly ugly. Um, the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, which is also linked to some um, sort of fundamentalist Islamic groups that have uh, perpetuated terrorist attacks on the government, um, versus the, the Awami League, which is a more of a secular party. So these two things have um, created ongoing coups. I mean, the number of coups that have happened and the number of failed election attempts is sort of mind-boggling. Um, and so really, since 2009, the, that kind of political violence has increased a great deal. So what I'm wondering is, you know, could it be something about Nepal reaching a peace agreement so it's political chaos kind of dying down in Bangladesh um, having increased struggle among these two parties that has really trickled down into you know there have been massacres and particularly Dhaka the the capital city um, you know that that has increased so could that have anything to do with the increase in Bangladeshi trafficking and decrease in Nepali so this is like my hypothesis and I but I did um, go to some sources on the ground because you really it's almost impossible to find this out in any real way right because no one's reporting how many slaves they're trafficking it's just not we can't get that data so um, <laughs> unfortunately so um, I did go to three different NGOs that are working with um, girls and women rescue foundation um, women's interlink foundation in um, Calcutta and another Calcutta based um, organization and all three of them confirmed that they are seeing fewer Nepali more Bangladeshi girls and women. Um, and, they, and they said, yes, we think it could have something to do with this. We also think that in Nepal, there's been a great increase in border control because of the work of people like Anuradha Kerala. However, on the other hand, another person said um, that may be true. And he said another problem, though, is um, Bangladeshis are being trans, um, like they're go going on a transit route that includes Nepal now because um, some places in the Middle East are not accepting Bangladeshi migrant workers anymore. And so now they're going into Nepal to get false visas and passports, Nepalese, and then they're being trafficked from Nepal um, at risk of being trafficked and often are trafficked. So, you know, all of this is so open to shifting landscapes around you know again economics and the global economy um, but also some political issues and then 
really the big thing is ongoing poverty and, and the wealth gap. Um, so I'm just, you know, I, I, I did this for this talk. Even I don't feel qualified to make any judgment about whether this these political hypotheses might hold true. But I want to offer them to you just to say it's one way to think about changes in patterns in trafficking and thereby to think about possible solutions um, moving forward. And that when you're dealing with trafficking, there's almost no way to get very concrete about things like this. Um, but what we can get concrete about are some things that we see for people who have been rescued or taken out of that, gotten out of that situation in whatever way. Um, so I, this, to me, is the much more important and stable data. And this, so this is a report. It's called Where Have All the Flowers Gone? It was very recent, 2010, released from Jadavpur University, um, called An Evidence-Based Research into Sex Trafficking of Girls in West Bengal and Andhra Pradesh. And what I really appreciated about this, it was completely empirical and, again, on the, from the ground up. Um, I find, cause, you know, even for this talk, I did a lot of research in terms of the, the you know, the very big, you know, up here kinds of views from the trafficking in person, the State Department, and so on. Then I talked to my colleagues who are down there on the ground chasing after girls and knowing, like, okay, if you were trafficked from this part of Bangladesh, you're likely in this brothel area in Mumbai. And I'd much rather go, I'll go with this data almost any time over that sort of very large, um, you know, bird's eye view. And so again, here, these were people who were on the ground in West Bengal, which was up in the sort of northwest there, and in Andhra Pradesh which is in the southwest, and they were um, just interviewing people, survivors of trafficking, families of trafficked victims, traffickers, the whole spectrum to try to put together um, a, a kind of a puzzle for how do we deal with this problem really on a, on a micro level. Their number one conclusion was interventions must happen in source, not transit or destination sites. That means go to the place where girls are being trafficked from and deal with those spaces. Stop because there's so much resources and attention on the destination place. You've been trafficked to Mumbai, you just got rescued from a Mumbai brothel, we'll put you in a Mumbai shelter home. Now that's a girl from Bangladesh or Nepal or from Maharashtra, you know, somewhere. She is not wanting to be in Mumbai for the rest of her life. And she has nothing to do in Mumbai, nowhere to go from Mumbai. So, and you're also not going to be able to prevent any trafficking if you're focusing on those destination sites. So both for preventive reasons and for reintegration reasons, the number one conclusion was Put your resources differently, A. And B, um, this was just a quote from them, uh, survivors' context, family, community, and the context of rural India at large were desperate and gloomy. And that is probably true for the girls in Bangladesh and Nepal as well. Desperate and gloomy. There's very little attention paid to this context. So even after all the assistance of recovering prostituted girls and women, the context they're returning to raises serious questions in the wisdom of them returning to situations of deprivation and abuse. So they're, they're um, Again, that what they said to us was, it's exactly this kind of strategy of empowering afterwards that we need. Because otherwise, girls, even if they do make it back home, they're in the exact same situation that created it. So here's our mission. We're looking for high value employment for survivors. So a lot of what we see in NGOs, to be perfectly honest, is not helpful. It's small little training programs, stitching, you know, baskets, whatever. That's, it's not really going to get anyone anywhere. There's not markets, even if they, you know, are making nice products, there's not really markets for them. And so, so we're looking not for that kind of um, program, but up for a high value, meaning high wage, high status. Um, so what we're trying to do is manufacture for export, not for internal markets. And then we also, as part of our mission, use our marketing of our products to educate the public about slavery. Although we have to do that less and less because so many people now know about it. When I used to talk about this eight years ago, honestly, people were kind of like, slavery? What do you mean? What are you talking about? You know, really, there was not. And I still kind of think, I mean, I ask my students all the time, how did you find out about trafficking? And they'll say, taken, right? Like, I don't know. I know <laughs> you guys are like, oh, God. But truly. I mean, that, that helped, you know. There was a Lifetime movie called, I think it's called Human Trafficking. Um, it was like in 2007 or something like that. And if you look at Google Trends for the words like tr human trafficking or slavery, it just, it was, just, it was like, mm, and then just this spike. And, and it was a Lifetime movie. It was actually pretty good. Um, so, I mean, it was, you know, given, given what it could have been. So, um, so we don't have to do that as much anymore, which means we can focus a lot more on business solutions. We 
believe we are responsible for all the marketing for everything that the girls and women who work for us do um, because we don't think it's reasonable to expect them to both produce and to have to then market their goods and that's that's our role that's us what we do as a partner to them um, <clears throat> here's our core business assumptions job creation must not be a path to a sweatshop and it could be very easily I know it seems like an obvious thing but it, it really could be so we absolutely we are vigilant about that um, here's the biggest biggest problem we have to solve and I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out there to you with some I'm gonna give you some model business models we're working on if any of you have any ideas please come we're just working this out but we need to create small shop production centers that can migrate with girls when they migrate and I'm going to tell you a story based on a particular woman um, to, to show to illustrate that for you but it cannot be that we have right now we have production centers in major cities where our shel where shelter home partners are that's not going to be good enough anymore because our survivors again they don't want to stay in the place where they were trafficked to um, so we have got to start moving where they move and serving them in that way um, our goal is that survivors would be trained in the business in that sort of um, rehabilitation stage in the shelter home and then we, they would become our business partners. They would co-own their business until the point where they could wholly own their business and we're just experimenting with that, our first one in Dhaka, Bangladesh right now. Um, ultimately our goal is to have a lot of survivor owned businesses that will be part of a network um, that's marketed here. And we also have to have some sort of large production capacity to fill large orders otherwise we're net we're always gonna you know we're not gonna be able to um, employ enough people right now we turn away a lot of girls and women who desperately want to be in our production program and that's horrifying to have to do so we have to increase our sales and fill larger orders in order to um, to, to really empower more and more people. Uh, we cannot do any more, you know, we started out, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of our early products. We can't do handicraft stuff. That's, it's already being done. There's not enough big enough in, impact on it. Um, and it's also not really high value employment for them. Again, it's like if it's stuff that they're doing already and they can do, it's, it's like that is not sort of honoring them and respecting them enough as artisans to say, you need to have, bring more value to this product so that it will sell in a global market and not be not be a sympathy sale. We're really moving from selling on the story to selling on the product. Um, so they kind of have to have barriers to learning. Otherwise, there's no real value for the survivor. Um, so we're trying to work on brand and design premium. Um, we need to somehow have consistent global access to raw materials. We have to have, if we're gonna have a lot of small centers producing stuff to fill big orders, we gotta get them the same products, raw materials and so on. And that's, that's a tricky proposition. Um, we can't let them be, obs there has to be a low risk of obsolescence. Meaning, you know, if you buy like a, what am I wearing? Okay, so this is kind of a simple thing, right? Like this is, it, to, in order to be not to not become obsolete quickly, we have to do really kind of classic modern styles that are not going to be like the trend right now. A big chunky beaded thing, or a you know color this that. Um, it's we've got to sort of get that element of the products out of there because that again is not going to help sustain people over a long term. But we don't ever want to crush the creativity of the people who are our artisans. So how do we do that? And how do we have a high profit margin? So here's some images of what, you know, the first stuff we did. And frankly, I really loved, like that second one from the left, I always wore that and I love that piece. And, but this, was what, this is what Sarah brought back from that very first trip. This is what girls were making for art therapy. Um, so there's no real skill here, you know, not much at all. It's just stringing beads. Um, here's like very simple stitching with not great fabric that you could find in any local market on the street. Um, likewise here, and again, this isn't gonna be that high hot of a product here. It's just not. It's kind of, it's not very stylish in a, in a Western market and so on. So here's what we're doing now. Um, and this, I can proudly tell you that um, every one of these pieces, except for the one that says hope, um, was designed by survivors. So what we've been doing now is to use partnerships to, of designers from the West to work with survivors to say, how can we create designs that reflect your vision, your ideas, your creativity, but that also we think could have a higher profit margin because they're metals and sell better in a Western market or a broader global market. 
the Hope One was created by a really great designer in the UK who did a design line for us. And um, so that's the only one, again, that was not designer, uh, survivor created. Our number one seller is that Freebird necklace down in the lower left. And that was, you know, the girls talked about freedom. They talked about the bird as a symbol of freedom. Um, and it and it resonates for them and it resonates I think for us um, here it's a, like it's a nice piece it's a simple piece um, <clears throat> so why jewelry we now focus almost exclusively on jewelry well raw materials and tools are widely available so it used to be with with some of this stuff we'd be like okay send us like four you know 45 of those blue bags and we'd get like 20 blue bags and 10 red bags and a couple of tie-dye bags you know and we'd be like we can't you know we can't fill orders like this and so that's partly about materials not being available if girls are getting let's say silk fabric on the corner from the sari shop it's going to be a different fabric next month they're not gonna be so that's you know what this is about now we just you can get silver and you can get gold and you can get copper and that's metal smithing here's the number one reason we're going for this it is a very high status status occupation for women in India um, really these are some of the first women metal smiths in the country and they now are really empowered in that sense because this was a male only profession as many things have been um, the other thing about doing metals is it's pretty empowering they are hammering they're cutting they're sawing they're sanding it's very visceral physical it's like a um, it's a powerful sort of trauma you know release mechanism and we do a lot of talk about the therapeutic value of doing that kind of work and it's again it's highly creative um, you can do it in small production centers which is what we need because we're never going to make that sweatshop um, highly repl replicable as we've got uh, survivors now creating their own training videos for other survivors so you can get a video in your language in Bengali in whatever your language is that says here's from step A to Z to make that free bird what you do so that we can have them create the curriculum um, and use the technology to get that curriculum out to all the centers um, and so margins keep growing for us and we have more of a brand premium so here's an example of a new piece and then here's you know a little little something you can look at that price you know we would like to be um, <laughs> selling our our lovely bangle um, maybe not for 475 but you can see that at least there's some design elements from that are going to appeal to a Western market and then there's um, others that are indigenous to the designers so here's an image of a woman working in in one of the studios um, here is one of our production centers in Calcutta you can see that it's like a really happy environment the survivors decorate and paint it themselves um, they it's just a very very bright um, joyous place of solidarity and community you know and when you're in there often there will be tears you know there will be people who've just been rescued or you know people even people that it's been quite some time and but there's a lot of community in those spaces um, there's some really profound craftsmanship going on here um, so I want to just talk to you about this business model that we're working through and um, that we have high hopes will change literally the world. Um, so our idea is this. Uh, here's, our, here's our producers, right? So normally, if I wanted to get my stuff into a big retailer, let's say Target, because we're talking to Target right now. So, um, and Target's interested in us, by the way, so keep your eye out on Target. Um, <laughs> I know. So, um, so normally, if I'm going to fill an order at Target for oh, 10,000 pieces or units, I'm going to have to make a big old factory, right? That's the only way I'm going to be able to do that. We're not going to do that. We're never going to do it. Partly because we're not going to create a sweatshop condition, Part, and you know, and because our, because the girls and women we're dealing with, they have really been profoundly traumatized, and we, they need, they do not need to be in that kind of environment. You know, a lot of what goes on in these spaces is just healing. Um, over time, over years, not just the first six months or year or whatever. So it has to be that kind of environment at least for the first few years. But also because, as I said, we want this to be able to go with survivors where they're going. Now, if they're going to a remote village in Bihar state, 
state. There's, there might be only, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of them. There might be 30 of them in Dhaka, Bangladesh. There might be, so it's never going to be a big, we're never going to have big producers. How can we do it? How can we make these small little producers, little workshops all over the world function as one big factory? That's our conundrum. So fortunately, Sarah's husband, I told you he was a stockbroker, amazing guy, literally gave up his job, gave up the income, gave up the house. Gave, they live it, you know. Um, and he now works 100% on this business problem. So the first thing we're doing is having designers input designs. And that was the, that first, so we have Rhode Island School of Design, a design school in the UK, Falmouth University, and um, School of Visual Arts in New York. They're all partnering with us. We now have a, a jewelry trainer who just runs all of that. Amazing people who go and they work with the girls and it's just, it is really beautiful what comes out because it's like, what, what are your visions? When I last visited the workshop, I'll show you a woman who just, when I got there, she was like, here's all the stuff, you know, in my spare time, here are all the new designs that I created. And it's, it's thrilling to see that happen. Um, so designs coming in and then products going out. We need, you know, designs and raw materials. How are we going to coordinate it all? If we could have 10,000 pieces made from all these uh, small production centers, how are we going to get them all to target in that? So we need some sort of we're working on a software platform that would be on mobile phones um, because they all can get access to mobile phones. You know, you can be anywhere. You can't get a computer, electricity, all that stuff, but you can get a, you can get a mobile phone working. So all of that's going to be this infrastructure on mobile phones, and MIT is helping us out with that, um, which is great, you know, MIT students and faculty and so on. Babs and students are doing the business plan because they're brilliant. Um, and then, so then hopefully all of this will go to big retailers and small, smaller retailers. And the goal is to employ more and more people, survivors of slavery, and to prevent slavery from happening. So here are our partners right now. This, that idea we're calling the micro supply chain, as in the supply chain for Big corporations and small retailers alike could be micro. It doesn't have to be sweatshops. That model, like I don't think any of us really want to buy that stuff anymore, you know? So I th I'm finding that corporations are really interested. They're like, yes, how can our, you know, Target was like our companies, our consumers don't want us to be big box. They don't want to get all, they don't want all their stuff to be China, you know, just China made and shipped in. And so um, we've got in our micro supply chain laboratory, Babson, MIT, Rhode Island School of Design, Stanford works on on social media and marketing for us. University of Falmouth UK works on design and School of Visual Arts we just added. So it's a really strong consortium. It gives me a lot of hope that we're going to do this. We also have some corporate partners. Toyota. Um, I feel like Toyota could be doing a little more to be honest, but um, <laughs> but, but I shouldn't look a gift horse in the mouth. In the mouth. They are helping us. Um, Target, who is really seriously considering being a distribution channel for us, which would be a game changer. Jaipur Rugs is an amazing organization. If you look up Jaipur Rugs on the internet, you will be amazed at their rugs. They're all over. You can get them in like Pottery Barn. And, um, but they are so micro that they literally go to women's houses in the villages and they bring one loom with a pattern, a design, and they say, okay, make the, because these women can't even go out of the house. So they bring it to them, make the rug, check the rug, quality control as it's being made and then go pick up the rug and bring the next design. They're that small and they're really amazing. So they're a partner. Uh, Manpower Group, who is a big global employment agency, they're a partner. Um, so our whole idea is about partnership and using partnership to motor this thing forward. But here's our most important partnership. These are, our, these are the, the artisans that we're working with. Um, so this woman, I want to tell you her story as a way of illustrating why I think this is so crucial. This is Baby. And she is from Bangladesh. And she was trafficked when she was about 17. And I met her when she was 22 or 3. She'd been in a brothel for about five years. She was our head um, trainer and master artisan in our production center in Mumbai. Um, <clears throat> Baby, when I met her, had this story to tell me. She said, I have... I, I'm in an impossible situation. Um, I have a daughter who is back home, and she's with my husband, um, and I think she's not in school. But my sister is willing to get her into school. So if I keep working here at the shelter home for Made by Survivors, and I make about 2,100 rupees a month, which is about three times what I could make or any, you know, anyone I know makes anywhere, I can send the money back and she can go to school. Here's the other um, 
thing that you should know about her situation. Her husband is the one who trafficked her. So she is now sitting in a shelter home in Mumbai knowing that her daughter, who is about eight, is with a man who trafficked her baby, um, who could easily traffic their daughter very soon, if not immediately. Um, or her other choice, go back and be with my daughter and actually try to protect her and care for her and be her mother and not have any income. So now she, baby, would be vulnerable to being trafficked again, as would her daughter. So when I talked to her, I thought, my God, that's what we call a Sophie's Choice, if you've, you know, if you've ever seen that film from back in the day, about a mother having to make an impossible choice. Um, what would you do? You know, I, I'm a mother, and I truly, it just ripped me apart to even think of it. And so the whole goal of the micro supply chain is to get a center to where baby's going. Now, since this photo was taken, and this was her just, I'm trying on all the stuff that she had made that were just her, her designs, and it was fantastic. Um, she, what we want to do, since she, since that picture was taken, she was repatriated to Bangladesh. Again, because now India's like, get out. You're, you're an illegal immigrant here, you gotta go back. Which is another, you know, just horrific pressure on people who've already been so traumatized. It used to be that they could stay in the shelter home for up to two years, or even more, particularly if their case was being prosecuted. Now, the governments of both India and Bangladesh, well, mainly India, not so much Bangladesh, is not so excited about getting their their survivors back but India is saying we've got Skype now just go on home and you can testify by Skype so now it's like six months and you're you're gone so we're facing incredible pressure and the, the legal people all of them in those homes are facing a lot of pressure about how to deal with and reintegrate girls and women but it would think any okay here's Dhaka Bangladesh and there's baby center and so we actually sent her back with a cell phone and a salary and we said we're gonna get the funds to start this center so that you can then She's got six or seven other trained artisans and she can start her business. And that's where we are right now with her. But you know, all I have to do is think about her story and think about her child and think about her situation and I am on fire to make this happen. Um, so, you know, our tools are really boiled down to employment is the biggest one in the center there, but education also, because if you can educate a child through high school, it's virtually guaranteed that they won't be trafficked or re-trafficked. So a lot of the girls that come out of slavery, we try to get in school, and you'll see, I'll show you. So here's some of our girls and women. So that actually is on, the, on our right is Sarah the blonde woman and her husband John. And what they're doing in this, um, and the woman standing next to John is named Joelle. She is um, our one of our Asia uh, staff people. And the other woman sitting down is Triveni, who is a, a runs something called the Rescue Foundation. That's just an amazing organization that pulls not only rescues girls and women, but also um, ha runs this shelter home. But the girls there, you can see that are in uniforms, they're studying, they're all in 10th grade, and so they're gonna get their 10th grade um, degrees and hopefully graduate from high school. But also what they're getting on that blackboard is a is an um, introduction to entrepreneurship and business. So what that does, you can't necessarily see it, but it's showing them, here you are making your product, here's where, here's the person in the US who might be buying it, here's what it has to go through to get there, Here's why, for instance, quality control has to be so so good. You can't send like a little bit of a crappy, you know, like you, you know. So it's like so they're getting this kind of both their regular standard education and then a business education as well. Um, the implications of a micro supply chain are that you know to get people beyond local markets and this is why I want to say to you that if this model worked I think it would be world changing because right now there are so many small scale producers remote producers fair trade producers who can't get to markets outside of their own small market but if they could couldn't that be a counter to those big giant transnational corporations that are just selling us more and more of the same stuff that doesn't have have social benefits doesn't have environmental benefits and that's what we're trying to go for um, we're also trying to you know all of this stuff about getting past um, advantages to though that that are op owned by those transnationals um, that's what we're trying to do um, it if if microfinance reduced barriers to credit are you all familiar with the microfinance movement the small you know micro loans um, Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank and and all of that 
So I want to tell you, that is, I think, a wonderful innovation. However, I was recently at the UN with um, a group of women who were there under something called the Women's Empowerment Principles. And they were all talking about women and, and sort of work and careers. And the, the women from Europe and the Americas, Latin America, North America, um, and even from Asia were all saying like, oh, you know, that glass ceiling is, you know, we can't get through it and we're not enough women CEOs and all this kind of thing. The women from Africa were saying, CEOs like we are microfinanced to death and we are we are sick to death actually of, of being still in this stage of like just a slightly higher poverty slightly higher level of poverty we don't want micro anymore we would like to be thinking on a much larger scale and it was a, a really profound moment and I think that's one of the critiques of the microfinance movement is that it keeps everything micro so we're saying we're kind of the the complement to that because we're reducing those barriers to business growth that if a woman gets a micro loan and she can only make things for her immediate market, that's not really going to ever take her so far. And we're hoping we can take people very far with this, this model. Um, <coughs> so, you know, I'm going to kind of, I want to move along because I want to give time for discussion. So this is sort of stuff about business again. This is just a couple images from Rhode Island School of Design. Um, just to give you a sense of like, so those are students who are designing for us and it's just, it's really wonderful. They've, you know, a group of them went to India last summer. They worked with our survivors. But they're also, they're very mindful of the indigenous traditions, the aesthetics, the materials, and so on in making things that I hope are desirable in a global market but also retain some integrity for the people who are making them so they're using um, those in those are called doka beads dora beads sorry in the in the left and they're made by an indigenous women's cooperative in India that then they sort of string together with some metals and create this beautiful look the one in the bottom there the, with the picture of the woman wearing that is bamboo so they're trying to use natural materials um, sustainable materials and and um, the lotus flower these are all symbols that are that are uh, sort of indigenous to India. This is another example. This was the design label made by um, the folks in UK and they did this amazing big photo shoot with all these people, did a big gallery opening. They've got like the bags, the t-shirts, the pendants and they have it in free, they have it in hope and they're, you know, I think they're, they're very marketable. Um, but they also again represent the ideas around freedom for people who have survived. Um, I'm going to just kind of get out of this business thing and tell you one last um, piece that, again, I, at the beginning I started by saying I think the, one of the toughest things for us is not the business problem. Um, I mean, it is the economic, the poverty of the whole global marketplace. That's why we're really thinking of that micro supply chain not just as a solution for survivors or people who've been trafficked, but as a much bigger way to intervene in this really unhealthy cycle of consumerism that we have going. Um, but here's, here's a problem. The, the, the problem of how girls are valued and devalued around the world still. Um, so I'm, this is an image that I took from a night shelter in um, Sanagachi, uh, which is a red light district in Calcutta. It's thought, it's thought to be the biggest red light district in, in Asia. Um, <clears throat> and actually, it's not Rescue Foundation. I'm sorry, it's Women's Interlake. But I am taking that photo standing up. And that the room ends like where the picture ends. So if you can imagine, this is a shelter home for kids in a brothel area who at night would normally be under their mother's bed while she's working. Um, but this you know, amazing NGO has set up in this red light area alone, there are 80 night shelters for the kids to come in. And literally, they're crammed in like sardines, but they're just, they're together. It's light and bright. They're not in that other space. Um, and they're sometimes learning, you know, they're doing some literacy work, some songs, maybe some embroidery or sewing, or um, it's really quite an incredible space. But you're thinking about all this generation coming up. Um, I also thought I would just show you an image of the, the level that we're working with, the book on the left is called The Missing File, and it's just literally a collection of people having made claims, like my daughter didn't come home from work, my daughter, you know, had a, had a creepy boyfriend and now she's not here anymore, or so just photos and, you know, of people looking for their family member, that's that file. And here's Missing Found, the lovely book of people who've actually been relocated. And the, the men who do this, um, 
are really phenomenal. I, I wish I could, there's a video link here. I'll, maybe I'll send it to Carol. Uh, these are men who, who have given up everything really to do this work to their lawyers and police officers and so on. Who've, you know, I asked one of them because they go into brothels, they do a lot of work to befriend the girls and gain their trust before they can even begin to think about a, a rescue operation or a raid on the brothel. Um, and I asked one of them like, how is it for you to do this here? Because truly the way that people talk about the red light areas, at least in India, and I haven't talked to people in Bangladesh or Nepal, is like, well, those are bad girls. So those are the girls that are there because they're bad girls and men have needs and, you know, until they get married and so on, they, you know, they have, they have needs and they need women to take care of those needs and then, but that keeps our good girls good and sort of clean and pure. And, uh, you know, this, the, one of the guys, I said to him, Why, how are you doing this? Like, first of all, your, your life is at risk because, and the woman, um, Treveni, who I showed you the picture of her, the Rescue Foundation director, her husband was killed in a really fishy car accident where his car, like the tire just came off and he went off the road. And, you know, it's, they get death threats all the time for this work because don't think the traffickers are really excited about people going in and taking their, their commodities out. Um, and they said, this guy said, you know, I just, this is, I, I can't live with it. I can't accept that this is happening. But he also said that his family completely disowned him. I mean, he got his legal degree and this is what he decided to do. And he said, they don't, my father, I'm done. I'm like, I'm like, it's like I never lived. Um, so they're really, really amazing people. Um, what I wanted to just tell you this story to give you an example of um, how, how I think this, this sort of anecdote illustrates the problem of the valuing of girls and women's lives. So when I first, the last time I visited um, the Rescue Foundation shelter home, the night I got there, they said, oh, we're so excited that you're here because we're having this wedding tomorrow. And we, we waited until you would come from the U.S. And, and so, and I was with a group of people from the U.S. So it was a, a wedding of five survivors. So here's two of them. And they were marrying five men. And so we were, you know, all of us saying like, that's great, but where'd you get the, who were the men? You know, and um, <laughs> we were a little, little uncomfortable comfortable and not wanting to be Western, you know, like impose our stuff. But we were sort of like, because there's so much stigma, who are these men and how did you find them and what do they know about these girls and how do you know that the, that the girls are going to be okay and because they're completely arranged marriages. And the woman, Treveni, she said, oh no, 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 they've all been checked out. We've, you know, done extensive research. They're, they know everything about their background. They're very excited to have them. Their family knows it's all fine. It's all going to be fine. And, but you know, it still left this really weird feeling for us. Um, and I started, I, I said to, to Treveni, I just pushed a little more and I said, well, uh, you know, why, why, are they, why do they want a woman who's been trafficked? Why do they want a former prostitute as a wife? Because there's such tremendous stigma here. And she said, oh, well, you know, we have a waiting list of 2,500 men here alone at this one shelter. 2,500 men who are waiting for a bride. I said, really? That's, why are they not marrying people in their village or their city or their home? And she said, well, they're just, they've passed the marriageable age and they don't have a bride. Oh, really? Why don't, why don't they have a bride? Huh? So I start to put this together with some other information, which is that you might have heard perhaps the term the missing millions from the economist Amartya Sen, who wrote about this back in 1990, so 20 some years ago. Um, the missing millions, girls who are the, the imbalance between girl children and boy children at the moment of birth. So the sex selective infanticide, so killing girl babies, um, selectively aborting girl babies, or the probably most common practice which is just sort of benign neglect of girl children. Um, so if you have a boy and a girl and your boy gets sick, he would, might get treatment, he might get to the hospital, a girl less likely. Um, food is scarce, boy is going to get more nutrition. And so, you know, since Amartya Sen first wrote that article, the gender imbalance has just really gone through the roof. And there are whole swaths of Asia, particularly China and India, where it's like 109 uh, boy children to every 100 girl children. And if you kind of blow that out to different communities because it's kind of concentrated in communities, you're going to find whole areas of people where, so, the, so this is what I kind of want to emphasize, that girls are devalued, their life as a girl is devalued from conception. And it's devalued because girls are more expensive because of dowry practices. They are not likely to, they, if they get married, they will go and be a resource in the husband's home. They will not 
be there to take care of their parents or contribute to that household. So in every way, they're a drain and a burden. Um, and so, so it's at the moment of conception and birth. And then it continues throughout. So these girls were trafficked. You know, right now they're about 17, 18. They were trafficked probably when they were 11 or 12. The average age of a girl, trafficked girl, is 11. Just, and I just think about that for a moment. You know, if, if any of you know a, an 11 year old or have seen one lately. Um, and I'm, you know, I just like, I'm sorry, Malika, to even be saying this in your presence. Um, but so they're devalued at this moment when they're sold and often, you know, sold for money for the family or whatever. Um, and then they're, d again, on the other side, they've been rescued and now they're, you know, to my mind, it was a happy occasion. They were going off to these new lives, but I thought now there's this marriage market for girls and women who have survived this and who are still valuable as a commodity, as their reproductive selves, as a marriageable person. So I wanted to conclude with that to just say, you know, this to me is the bigger problem. Um, I almost feel like we can, I don't know, you know, there's, there's ways to intervene in some of those other things that might be less intractable than this. Um, and just two other people, two other groups that I thought I'd just share, like what about, so these were prost former prostitutes that I met who were also coming to those night shelters. You know, what about those who managed to survive it for many, many years and now are just, um, you know, completely destitute. They can't work anymore. They're not valuable anymore in this way. These women are basically alive because they just, they have these quote unquote grandmother scholarships or grandmother's, um, you know, like a sponsorship um, to get a little bit of money to just keep them alive. They come to the night shelters with all the little kids and they're just crammed in there too. Um, and then how about this guy? F about 15 year old. His name is Shiraj, meaning son. And he is this bright, bright bulb who is, was also I met in the night shelter, who has big dreams of going to the university, but he's growing up in a red light area. So most likely he will be sucked into that system. Um, so what about the boys who uh, are also really at risk for becoming you know, part of the system that they don't want to? This guy walked us in and walked us out and was just fierce about this kind of sense of protection in spite of all the nasty stuff that people were saying. And he, um, it, he was just a tremendous uh, sort of um, soul. And I thought, you know, at, who knows? So those are some of the, the problems and the, the people, I guess the real humans that I, I would just like to um, leave you with and, and to open up for discussion. And thank you so much for listening. And I know a lot of you need to get on your way, so no worries. Um, Elizabeth, I'm, first of all, thank you so much. I think for um, those of you who've been coming to our talks for a long time, it's interesting to think about both the ways in which the conditions that lead to trafficking are also some of the same conditions that lead to women joining, women and girls joining non-state armed groups and that some of the problems of reintegration and thinking about economically sustainable reintegration that isn't about beating and that isn't about um, you know very small scale non-sustainable work are some of the same problems that people face when they're thinking about disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration of girls and women. Uh, which mostly people think about too little um, and do too little about. Um, I'm going to have Elizabeth field your own questions. We, when you ask a question, uh, first of all, somebody's going to hand you a microphone. The microphone won't amplify your voice. It'll just record it, so you'll need to speak loudly. <laughs> um, <laughs> Secondly, please identify yourself when you stand up. Tell us your name and what you do. Um, and, yeah, and speak loudly. <laughs> so, um, so with that, I'll turn it back over okay, to you. Thanks. She's behind you, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. It's, uh, Wonderful to know that you've been able to mobilize so much energy and commitment to, to try and help with this sort of never-ending problem. But it's mm -hmm. the never-endingness that, that worries me and the more fundamental 
Oh, I'm Jane Parpart. I'm professor at UMB in the new PhD program in global governance and human security. Yeah. And, uh, and I've worked on Africa and gender for many years. Uh, and one of my concerns is how do we address these deeply embedded notions of gendered hierarchies, of gendered inequalities. I saw a documentary recently where a girl that had been forced, abducted and forced into a marriage was discovered and the husband, the husband and the brother who had been sleeping with her and then she kept having girl children so they did they, she had abortions and then the mother-in-law were all shrieking at the person taking the girl away saying and the mother this is a woman with enough money and a big household to do this she said I paid for her mm. she's mine mm -hmm. and her two sons said yes she's ours we own her yeah. now that's the thing we really have to get below the surface right. of fixing is if people think that way in large numbers and not just poor people but people with privilege with yeah. education yeah. thinking that it's okay to buy other people yeah. and steal them yeah. then it's just you know it's just band-aid we're just right. putting band-aids right. on but the problem's going to continue so right. what are your thoughts on the long-range types of solutions yeah. the much deeper solutions in changing people's attitudes about gendered practices yeah and their practices of that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I, I think I want to say that um, the business solution that we're trying to think about, we're hoping would be more than a Band-Aid. Um, so that is one piece that's about a kind of, because I do think so much of this has to do with the, the system that we're all profoundly implicated in. And we, I think a lot of us feel very stuck in it. We can't, how do we, how do we not consume in ways that perpetuate this, which, you know, so that I think could be quite major. But to your point, that's exactly why I ended here, because I think you're right, that's never going to really do anything as long as human life is so profoundly devalued and particularly along gender lines. Um, the two things that I think have worked in some areas, one, well one, I don't know that it's been tested much yet, but I think there's a lot that could be done with um, what people call, quote unquote, the demand side in the sex trafficking equation. So men, um, and educating men. and. Uh, I had the great privilege last year to start a workshop for boys who'd been rescued from slavery to educate them about the kinds of slavery that girls might have endured and how they could not, as Indian men, become part of that, so that they could become aware. It was really interesting because they were kind of young, so they weren't so clear about brothels and what brothels were, but the way they translated it in their mind was forced marriage or child marriage. So what they said, we kept saying ending um, brothel slavery or trafficking and they kept saying ending child marriage and no girl should have to be married when she's just a little child and I thought that was really interesting they translated it into their local context so I do think it's been untouched like in this country there's some programs for Johns for people who've been arrested um, for prostitution clients and it's like well either you can get exposed in a big way and everyone can know about your crime and so on or you can come to this education program I mean like in San Francisco they have a big in New York they have big programs and men have said oh you know, very enlightening to me to know uh, from the perspective of the prostitute and so on and so forth. And so I think that there's a lot on the, the demand side that could be done. But you raise the important point that it's often women who are perpetuating systems of inequality and oppression for other women. One model that I think has worked, and it was profoundly grassroots when it finally took hold, um, and some of you might know more about it than I do, but I, I know a little something about the campaigns against what is alternatively called FGM, female genital mutilation, or cutting, or circumcision, depending on where you fall on the spectrum about it. Um, but I think there were some attempts to, to, you know, of people to come in and say, that's wrong, sort of, you know. And then culturally, women really pushed back and said no this is our practice this is what we do and so then the outside women were like how can you possibly you know be perpetuating this on your girl children and it ended up you know being a kind of partnership and people using um, I know there was a great deal of art and theater that was used and I've actually had the opportunity to talk to some activists recently in from Sudan who said where you know most all women were cut 
um, who said, you know, what, what a lot of families are doing now is they have a ceremony where they ceremoniously, they may sort of pretend to make a cut or they may nick the woman or, but they don't actually remove any part of her body. And that that's this sort of compromised position that um, has allowed the cultural, some of the cultural, um, whatever the richness was that people were feeling in that ritual to remain while the violation has been removed. So I don't, you know, I wonder about the the possibility of those kinds of campaigns. I think about Muhammad Yunus, who if you want to join his Grameen Bank and become, and he only lends to women, and he lends to them in groups, and if you want to become one of those groups. You have to sign this thing, the 16 Principles, which is kind of fascist. If you ever, there's a film about it, you can watch it. It's really like, you will not do this, you will not do this, no dowry, you will, if your house, you know, needs a new roof, you will put a new roof, like, and, and I wonder about it. It's this just like imposition, but at the same time, it's gotten rid of a lot of things that you would think were just intractable. Um, another source for thinking about those kinds of grassroots efforts is Nicholas Kristof's book, Half the Sky, which you know, I, there's varying opinions about the work, but what I what I think is interesting is the idea that for every woman that you educate, she's more likely to make sure that her child, girl child, goes to school, or more likely to ensure that um, those kinds of things don't happen, or that she herself would not be part of that system. Um, certainly, in the brothel areas, women graduate from being you know, the trafficked woman, the prostitute, to being the brothel, the madam, the keeper, the, you know, and they're just sort of interpolated. And that's why I worry about people like Shiraj or, you know, or the women who then just end up being very, very brutal. But I think it's got to be a, a very grassroots process. And it, it may just well take forever, I, you know. But I do think there's been some success with the FGM campaigns. And that's, that's huge. So those kind of models, perhaps. I'd love to know what other people think about that, by the way. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sam. I'm a sociology student here. Um, I just had a question. I'm just curious about, like, so if the women who are making the jewelry are doing metal work, mm -hmm. and that's often seen as, like, a men's work, mm -hmm. I'm just curious, like, because the division of labor seems so, like, prominent and salient, mm -hmm. like, how... Do you ever get like cultural resistance from some of the survivors that come in and say, "I, I'm not a suited, I'm not suited to do men's work," but mm, because it's, yeah. well, I'm just wondering because, I'm, and it's because like it's jewelry, so yeah. maybe the counteract of that as well. Yeah. But I'm just curious. That's a great question. Thank you so much. I think um, a couple things we've seen. You know, we expected resistance a little more from communities than from the girls and women, to be honest. And and what we found is it's amazing empowerment. Like they go back and all the stuff that you to happen. I mean, I've seen women who before when they went back to their community, they just didn't have a place there and they were really ostracized in the most cruel ways. Who then came back with this cash money and, you know, they make a good that's our thing too, is we will not I mean, we pay literally triple at least what a wage would be because the wages are so ridiculous. So they're making a lot of money and that means it almost like slavery proofs them. Um, so that's one thing. So I think the, the money is a big draw but a second point is what we aspire to be is one choice among many. So a big part of becoming free is, is tr being able to make choices and have choices. So lots of people will say, well, like, do you force all women to do jewelry? No, like we want to be one program that they could choose from. And a lot of these, the shelter homes that we work with, we're pretty careful um, to make sure that they're solid because there's a lot of people actually tragically in Nepal, for instance, oftentimes there are NGOs that are fronts for traffickers. They traffic people in, they get money from the government for their, you know, the survivors that they're housing and they might be trafficking them and selling them and it's really quite, you know, as, about as low as you can imagine. So um, we're very, very careful about who we work with and they will, you know, almost always have a hospitality program, a, a beauty, a hair sort of program or other options that could be viable so that a girl could say, that's not for me um, and that would be just, fun. that would be brilliant. That's not for me. Great, you know, so glad that you're able to make that choice for yourself and then figure out what is for you. But we, uh, you know, right now are turning away way more girls than we could ever take. And part of the problem that really pushed us to think about this micro supply chain is working with people who are migrating back outside international borders so that like we were having to turn away Bangladeshi girls because we couldn't train, we didn't have enough time with them to train them 
if they were going to leave. And we thought, oh, so that's great. Now we're like discriminating on the basis of nationality and, and what boils down to nationality and ethnicity. This is like, this is unacceptable. So we have to think of another model. Um, and most of them are just very eager to participate um, in a creative livelihood that, that is also has a, a wage attached. So, yeah. Yes. Oh. Hi, my name is Katrina and I'm a student in the Spanish department. And I just wanted to say that um, I did get introduced to Made in Nepal uh, quite a while ago. Great. And we've been doing actually fundraiser in YMCA in Cambridge for the past three years. So oh, that's I wonderful. invite everybody, it's April 20th. Um, it's a pretty big event. So my question was about even the Tiffany and Company, the bracelet that you showed. Um, do you think it's possible to um, maybe introduce this idea to some big marketed brands? And I'm pretty sure that they're going to embrace it and maybe do certain shows or imply the designs. Maybe even girls don't have to make the jewelry. They make it, they'll just put the brand name together with theirs, you know? Oh, that's so interesting. You can yeah. do it make it big yeah yes I know <laughs> we're, we're working on it absolutely I mean I'll tell you though it's funny people are not as quite as you know forthcoming about that as we might expect like for me I'm like what what's not to love like you know um, but it's not they're not always just like yes there's a lot that goes into it for them and thinking mm -hmm. about how they're gonna market it and well um, I wanted yeah. to say that in case if somebody goes to their show or mm -hmm. like Pandora you know the bracelets they're yeah. very famous yeah even their the pieces that they right. put together they're very similar with the designs of the even in right. indigenous right. women there so if somebody goes to their event and if they're selling it on the Pandora but in um, in relation to the free program, right. I'm pretty sure that any rich person or woman who buys it, if they know that behind this bracelet is this, yeah. they'll buy this one, actually. You know? I'm so glad to hear you say that. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's, it, is an, it is a journey that we're taking, but we are trying, you know, and the other thing is though, we're limited in terms of how much outreach we can do all the time to different companies. And so, you know, we would love if anyone had any energy that they wanted oh, yeah. to reach out to like a <laughs> Tiffany's or, um, it's fascinating though, like sometimes we'll find, oh, um, we would like to sell one of your pieces, but for instance, right now it's very hard to certify ethical metals, and the only way we can do it with silver is to use always recycled silver. That's the mm -hmm. only way that it, because there's just no clean, environmentally and socially clean. And so we're like, we're working on our own supply chain, so it gets complex, but honestly, um, if you have more ideas like that, I'd love to talk to you, and okay. Pandora's a great idea, mm -hmm. you know, because those charms, I mean, that's like, mm -hmm. okay. you whip them out, so thanks. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Kate. I'm an intern here at the consortium. Um, I just wanted to follow up with something you mentioned at the very beginning. I think it was one of your first two or three slides. You had mentioned that intervention at the source was the key to success as opposed to addressing the issue um, where these women end up at their final destination. So if at all and how do you see Made by Survivors addressing that issue? Mm -hmm. um, are you working with partners on the ground to help get women trained so they're not you know, is apt to be trafficked or yeah. What, what approach are you taking? So absolutely, like our latest um, production center is in a place called Jaipal Gori, which is up in the north in the Darjeeling district. That is a major, again, it's like right in the center of Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India. And it is, a, it's a source, destination, and transit site for trafficking. So we put our latest center right there. And a lot of the girls that are employed there are, have not been trafficked, but they're at high risk. We, we're giving them employment before they would get trafficked. And that was, you know, the Jadavpur report that I mentioned, which I can also send the link to Carol, you know, to get, send out if people are interested. That was their big thing is like, if you, you need to try to slavery proof people before they could be trafficked. And you'd be amazed. Someone asked me, I, I was talking about this recently at a law school and it was so interesting. Those lawyers, I'll tell you, they just, they, I was like, I can't believe the way your minds think. Something I had never ever thought of. They said, well, don't you think that if you, if you employ a girl or a woman, and she's making that much more money than the average, isn't she just going to be so vulnerable to be exploited by the same people who would traffic her, right, to just take her money? And, and, it was, and I was like, wow, I hadn't, you know, ugh, so low. But, um, but we have not seen that, actually. We really have not seen that. And it's kind of the same thing that I think Muhammad Yunus has found with his work. It's like, 
uh, some of that stuff seems to go away. If a woman is contributing to her household more, it's almost like keep, keep doing your thing. Um, so that's kind of what we're trying to do is to slavery proof people. In that's, that's our first one that's in a source region. The Dhaka Bangladesh is also a source region, although we have people who are also being repatriated there. But our dream for Dhaka is that we will have Baby as our team leader, our captain there. And then we have a stream of girls and women who are coming from an organization called BRAC, um, the Bangladesh Rural Association Corporation, some, some. And um, they're the biggest NGO in the world. And they are saying, we need to get employment for our very vulnerable population here. And so that would also be prevent. So that's what we're trying to do is go to places that are source, sources and reap, you know, the same place that's a source is a place where people are repatriated. And that's where our micro supply chain is going. To, that's precisely our whole goal is get out of Mumbai, Calcutta, uh, maybe stay there a little bit, but also get to the source. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Anive. I'm from ID. I'm an international development student from Clark University, and I wanted to ask: after you create a sustainable and a strong supply model. Would you consider expanding to other countries that have high incidence of trafficking and maybe Absolutely. get a more ethnically varied uh, jewelry or other things yeah. so you can market them more? Absolutely, yep. And we have partners all over the world that um, are in sort of small programs that might pr be producing other things. Um, if you go to the Made by Survivors website, which is there, you'll see other products from like Uganda and some you know other places. But as we create this this model, this micro supply chain model, sort of um, working in India, which is where our headquarters are. But yes, I mean, ultimately the goal would be that this could be not only for us, we could be more in the world. But also this could be replicable and scalable for any other industry. So one of the places where this a lot of this work is being done and tested is Latin America. Um, and it's MIT is there working with, for instance, agricultural producers, farmers, who and they're getting them past, as they call it, the last mile. They're getting them to much bigger markets than they normally would using uh, cell phone technology, mobile phone technology, and it's really extraordinary what they're, how they're doing it, and how they're coordinating things like shipping and trucking, you know, stuff. Um, and so I think yes, once not only for us, but for almost every industry. And again, I think that could be a way to provide. If you think of transnational corporations as like the elephant in the room, to provide instead of just being a bunch of little mice or fleas nipping at that elephant, all the small scale fair trade producers, giving them some market share and some market power, so. Again, not just to us, but yeah, all over the world. And there's people are working on this, and I feel like it's going to come together in the next few years, and it's really going to change things. That's my hope. So, yeah. I, I think Malika agrees with me, don't you think? <laughs> She's like, yeah. <laughs> my name's uh, Janet Hunkel, and I am a master's student here in conflict resolution. So, my um, <coughs> paper is on how the effect of stigma and honor. And yeah. I'm interested in knowing, because you've mentioned stigma quite a few times. Um, actually, I have two questions. One, um, one is, do you also see the whole concept of the family honor um, affecting these girls and women? Mm -hmm. And then my other question is, and let me preface it by saying I'm really impressed with all that you are doing and don't want to okay. add anything else to your uh, list. Oh, but please, I bring it on. I am curious if there's any sort of spiritual um, programming that they uh, work with mm. the women. Mm -hmm. Um, for their re reintegration. Yeah, thank you so much for both okay. those questions. Um, so to the first one, um, yes, I think honor, but n so honor, absolutely. I just, I think when I, when I think of honor and gender right now, I think a lot about honor killing, you know, or that seems to be the, the word that's attached to honor. And so we don't see that as much as more ostracization, but because of dishonor brought on the family. But the, the kicker is, you know, the thing that's just so hard to wrap your mind around is it's oftentimes the family who has trafficked the girl. Um, so then when she gets back, she's uh, persona non grata there. And it's so I think it is a question of honor, um, maybe in a, in a broad sense, but that idea of you are now ruined and so you bring shame upon the family or you just can't be in this space or also you can't be married, which is again why to my mind it's such a, um, I'm still trying to figure out who these men are that are lining up to marry 
these girls and women, I mean, I get it, they don't have someone else they can marry, but I just don't know how they're dealing with that whole problem. But I, so I do think the stigma comes from, from an idea of honor about you're sort of, you're ruined, but also um, from, often just from disease. You know, a lot, a lot of these girls are HIV positive, and so that's also, so that's not so much an honor issue as just a stigma around the disease. Um, but another flip side of that, if you, another way to flip it is that, and this Jadavpur study um, talked about this a lot, girls are often trafficked by other girls who are returnees from the brothel who are sent back to traffic other girls in their village. And the reason they are trafficked, and the reason they're drawn to those girls, and I thought this was so important that this study pointed this out, the crushing boredom of poverty, the sameness of every day, the lack of anything to look forward to, the idea that you will be married off at a young age and not have a very uh, happy or prosperous life. Um, they talked about that, so when girls come back with jewelry, with makeup, with clothing, with you know, looking very glamorous from the city, that's an easy draw. So like on the flip side of the whole honor issue is the attraction to what just looks like a glamorous life and is pitched that way. So, and the other thing that they talked about in that study was the sheer credulousness, meaning gullibility of people who would say, who would know that a girl disappeared next door and would have no problem having their child go with that same person for a job in India. Or, you know, so there was this sense of like just kind of not putting all the pieces together, willful denial, if you, if you would. And then, but then when the girl comes back, if there's some inkling that she's been um, involved in that, then the dishonor would sort of come upon her. Um, so it's a very tricky and complex situation. Um, as for the spiritual training, yes, there is, um, you know, so like the Rescue Foundation, which, um, I showed you a couple images of girls learning there and, and working there. It's an amazing place where those girls are not only, they're doing yoga, so they do a kind of a yogic spiritual because they're, they're Muslim, they're Hindu, they're, uh, they're um, Buddhist, they're you know, many, many different religions, so they do a yogic practice that's quite spiritual and profound. Then they're doing karate, and they are, you know, they're competing in karate, and they are just kicking ass, if you don't mind my saying. And so that is, you know, a, there's all kinds of empowerment. They, we do health and human rights um, workshops. We talk very specifically about human rights issues. and so. Um, but there is that spiritual component, at least in the shelter homes that I've seen. Another amazing ashram for boys who've been rescued from slavery um, is in uh, Jaipur in Rajasthan, called the Bal Ashram, which just means boy ashram. And, those boys, they have a kind of a unity. They get up every day at dawn, they do yoga, and then they have this sort of unity celebration, which is, it has a spiritual element to it. They're lighting um, incense and they're praying, but they're praying not in any tradition, but rather about unity, the unity. So the incense signifies that we're all sort of breathing the same air together and they're very, that ashram, I mean those kids are more radicalized in the best possible way. They're out there advocating against child labor and um, a lot of that comes through this kind of spiritual, spiritual human rights idea of, of humanity through spirit. Um, so I have not seen people doing any, you know, you will not see, at least I've not seen in any of these spaces, anyone doing any particular religious tradition because there's just too many different kinds of people. But I've seen, a, you know, you use the word spiritual and you're right. Need yes, exactly. And you were exactly right about that. They will avoid the religious and go right to the spiritual, which is probably the better thing. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Rajni Srikant, um, and I'm a faculty member here. So you um, talked about, you know, the crushing boredom of poverty, and um, also your mention of the Baal Ashram. So maybe think about to what extent does the lack of, you know, schools, interesting schools in the source areas, play into the vulnerability? Has anybody done a study in terms of looking at the relationship between, you know, schools that matter, that mean something, right. and prevent, um, you know, prevent this kind of traffic? Yeah, yeah, that's such a great question. Thank you so much. Um, you made me think of a book that came out about a year and a half ago called Poor Economics by um, Esther Duflo and, and uh, Mukherjee. I think it's her. Thank you, Banerjee. Um, 
where they studied schools in India, not to think about trafficking, but just to think about poverty. And, and what they found was, you know, if something like 50% of schools, if they just did these sort of random trials where they just popped into the school, there would be no teacher, there would be no, you know, whatever. So I think that, yes, I mean, I don't know of any study that has then looked at how that's linked to trafficking which would be so important, but I do know most of the areas that we're working in or that are, that are source for our girls, like Bihar, notoriously underserved in every way by the federal government and then tons of corruption on the state level, so not a lot of, and, and particularly for girl children, not gonna get into school. And so I think that, and likewise Rajasthan, or so I think there could be a very strong uh, correlation. I don't myself know of any study that has really worked on it, but it's a, it's a kind of, it's a clear fix, you know, and, and it's really devastating to look at places where the corruption is so great that, that the education is just, you know, not happening. And, and in India, I've never been in a place with such a divide between rich and poor ever in my life. It's just, you know, I'm, it's bad here, but it's, it's unfathomable there. And so um, I think that, that that would be a really profound study for, for someone to do. Hi, my name's Paige. Um, I'm also an intern at the Consortium. And um, first of all, I think it's a really cool thing that you've been doing by sort of taking a business model and economics and integrating that with human rights campaign with this made by survivors. And um, it's awesome to see that there's so much potential for this to grow as has been demonstrated by all these ideas coming your way. Um, so my question to you, um, as I imagine you're competing with a lot of other businesses who don't employ the same practices, who are constantly right. exploiting labor and outsourcing labor. As you mentioned, you're paying uh, these women three times as much as a normal right. salary. So what, um, how have you made this model sustainable in a way that maybe other organizations or entrepreneurs could look at this as a way to maybe reshape how products are made and sold with this overarching sort of social good also um, a huge result of it as well. That is such a great question. Thank you so much. A big part of our problem is competing with you know, folks who are doing things very differently. Um, and that's also part of the problem with corporate social responsibility is that really, oftentimes, you know, what comes down as mandates around that, only the hugest corporations have the money to sort of do. And so then that crowds out other potential market entry for people. Um, we've been so fortunate that we have this brilliant business mind at our helm, John Berger. Um, and so he's spent, he's just spent so much time thinking about margins, 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 margins. So in terms of like the cost, labor and, and, and material cost versus what we're going to be able to sell it for. And one of the biggest ways um, that I think we've done it is to sort of take out any middle person. So our prices don't reflect oftentimes even for like big chain things there's there's lots of middle people that have to be sort of paid and we try to avoid that it's just our artisans and we try to get direct to a retailer or or us online um, so that's one thing our prices are but they're 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 high like with Target right now we've been talking about how are we gonna make something at Target prices we're gonna have to um, maybe do something like casting um, basically it was sort of they asked us we'll send us some products and prices and we said here's our products and prices but we're gonna do a whole other line for you and it's gonna have to be you know we're gonna have to look into some mass production that we've never done before everything's handmade but we'll have our it's fascinating though I'll just say to listen to someone like John who's just a business head I mean honestly when I listen to him I'm sometimes like <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got no idea, but um, he, and I'm sorry, John, if you ever see this, but um, <laughs> you're not just a business head, but, um, but he will say, he will take into account like, okay, that's not going to be challenging enough for our girls because casting is just about sanding and like a little bit of finish work and that's, that's just not going to be good enough for them. And so built into the business model is this really profound ethic about the people, the workers. Um, so we won't always be able to compete, but I think we're also, we're sort of coming along here trying to think of ways to get margins high for small scale artisans, fair trade people, while the consumers coming from over here demanding more, better, less China, less mass produced, less 
crap, you know, so I think it's like a, a sort of a double force happening. Also, it's getting more expensive to do business in places like China. Um, so people, we've found people want entry into India, but they don't always know how to deal with the bureaucracy there, and we have a lot of experience. So we say to them, that's our value proposition. We'll get you right in. We know exactly. We've already dealt with all the laws, all the export, all that stuff. We've got the, the producers. Um, so it's a really interesting moment, I think, in terms of global business, where there's starting to be more and more consumer pressure to not not necessarily just get the cheapest um, and and we're hitting that perfect storm I hope may I ask you to go back to your map for oh sure yes yes are you gonna ask me a hard geography question <laughs> no I'm not gonna ask you a question at all actually <laughs> I oh, passed it. Okay. Just um, before thanking you and bringing this event to a close, I just wanted to thank you for giving us a preview of our next event. Oh, cool. Nice <laughs> <laughs> going to be like, where's? There. You yeah. have Nagaland. <laughs> yes. And um, our next event, we are having a woman from Nagaland come to talk to us about the seven decade conflict that's been going on between Naga people and India and, and, and the state, a highly militarized conflict and the work that women have been doing to try to reduce conflict and build peace. So I, um, and so Singmila is really interesting. She'll be here talking about it and we hope to see you all and that will be on April 10th. I also wanna point out that although our usual time is four, that event will be from five to seven. And as always, there'll be food, so you can come even at that time. <laughs> um, That'll get us here. <laughs> so, um, so that said, with that plug done, let me again ask you to thank me, uh, join me in thanking Elizabeth Goldberg for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thanks to you.